catch up with the important things that we're going to cover today. All right. I am going to pass, I'm going to stop my screen now. I'm going to pass it to, um, I'm going to pass it to Prof Chen now. She will be uh, covering her part on the strategies. Um, after that, we will move on to the two and, and back and forth every, for every two strategies. All right. Um, I would like to welcome Prof Chen now. Prof Chen, are you ready? Are you there? Yes, Kiman. Thank you so much. Yeah, maybe you can do a quick introduction to yourself. Um, then uh, you can start your session. All right. Okay. Uh, I think maybe I'll just uh, share my screen first. All right. Okay. Can you see the screen? All right. Um, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining this uh, event. And thanks also to Kiman yeah, for uh, introducing the uh, session a while ago. Um, right, so, okay. For me today, I'm going to talk about uh, the mapping yeah, of at common teaching strategies with the relevant online learning design. Oh yes, I forgot, Kiman asked me to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm currently uh, the senior director of CAM in Unimas, yeah, right? Uh, so uh, I guess that will be adequate uh, on my introduction, yeah? Do not want to spend so much time on that, okay? So uh, today I'm gonna introduce you to uh, eight different common teaching strategies. And uh, uh, the most important thing is I'm trying to map yeah, these uh, common teaching strategies yeah, with the relevant online learning design. Yeah? So this is what I'm going to do. So without further ado, I'm going to show you uh, the first uh, teaching strategy, yeah, which is known as uh, direct teaching. Yeah? So uh, direct teaching, sometimes also known as uh, direct instruction, or uh, sometimes uh, in the university, maybe we will refer it as a lecture-based lessons. Yeah? So in direct teaching, it's very clear the instructor will need to teach directly to the learners. And usually the, the instructor will also provide learning resources, yeah, such as the lecture materials, references, demonstration, and so forth, yeah, in any appropriate media format. It could be in text, image, audio, video, animation, yeah. So uh, usually in direct teaching, yeah, the instructor will also provide some reinforcement activities yeah, to reinforce what had been delivered, yeah, uh, as well as to provide some uh, formative assessment yeah, to gauge the learner's understandings. So um, direct teaching, uh, basically we could see that uh, is actually a conventional teaching strategy. So if you are an ed educator, I believe you have adopted yeah, this direct teaching yeah, in your uh, teaching career. So it is a very instructor-centered approach yeah, in which the instructor basically follows the instructivist paradigm uh, where the instructor will have full control, uh, will decide on what to deliver yeah, and also will de decide uh, how it is delivered. Yeah? So uh, the content-wise, everything is actually within the control of the instructor. Yeah? So now the next thing that I want to talk about is actually the process yeah, in direct teaching. Yeah? So I actually have identified your yeah, three main steps in direct teaching. Yeah? So in the first step, you could say that the instructor provides direct teaching. Yeah? And the uh, roles of the learners basically is to passively receive knowledge. Yeah? And in step two, the instructor provides learning resources. So learners are expected to study the resources. And usually in the step three, learners are asked to participate in activities to reinforce their learning as well as to demonstrate their learning. Yeah? So these are the three steps yeah, that are basically uh, uh, the, the major characteristics of direct teaching. Yeah? So if I want to map yeah, these three steps yeah, to the online design, you know, how could this be done? Yeah? So in the first step, the instructor provides direct teaching. Means that in my online learning design, I need to actually provide either live or recorded direct teaching, right? Very straightforward, yeah? So in step two, instructor provides learning resources. So in my online learning environment, I will need to provide yeah, learning resources in appropriate media format for my learners. Yeah? And if we move on to step three, yeah, so learners participate in activities to reinforce and demonstrate their learning. So in my online learning design, I can actually map it by providing online learning activities to reinforce my students' learning 
and also provide an online space for learners to demonstrate their learning. See, can see clearly the mapping, right? So if I move further down here yeah, on the mapping, yeah, so if I have these steps here, the first step, and I need to actually provide either live or recorded direct uh, teaching. Yeah? So what are the online affordances yeah, that actually I can have here? Yeah? So basically I can provide live and recorded teaching by using some tools such as virtual conferencing tools, particularly if, if I want to deliver live teaching. Yeah? And also I can use uh, screen recording tools if I want to provide recorded teachings. Yeah? So just to give uh, some samples of uh, virtual conferencing tools, yeah? so the Zoom, like the, uh, the application that we are using now, is an example of virtual conferencing tool. But of course, we have other tools as well, like Microsoft Teams, yeah? Life Science, uh, Skype, WebEx, and so on and so forth. Yeah, this list is not exhaustive. And of course, if you have a screen recording, then you can actually use a tool such as PowerPoint recording. You can use a screencast automatic. Yeah, you can use video scribe. And uh, later on, Kiman is going to introduce you with another tool, which is called Loom, yeah? L O O M, which is also meant for screen recording. Okay. Right. So if I move on yeah, to the second step, yeah? so second step means that we actually need to provide learning resources in appropriate media format for our learners. So what are the online affordances that we have? Yeah? So in fact, there are a whole lot of learning resources creation tools yeah, that we actually can use to create our resources, either in the form of text, audio, video, or even multimedia format. Okay? So just to uh, show you some of the learning resources creation tools. So for those from Unimas, we are all very familiar with uh, Elite, yeah? Elite is the official learning management system for Unima. So this is an example of the tools yeah, like book, file, folder, label, and URL that you actually can use within the LMS itself to create your learning resources yeah, in uh, various formats. Yeah? The various formats. Yeah? And of course, you can use external tools. Yeah? Like for instance, if you want some video resources, you can actually look for resources from YouTube, yeah? from Vimeo, from Daily Motion, for example. Okay? And you also can create your own animation video by using applications such as uh, Microsoft uh, Stream, you can use a uh, Powtoon, uh, Biteable, yeah? Prezi Video, yeah? Vion, uh, Video Scribe. Adobe Animation and even Animaker, yeah? and the list once again is not exhaustive, yeah? right? So when you create your own video, sometimes you do need some video editing tools yeah, to help you to edit your video to customize it to according to your needs. Yeah? So we have some video editing tools yeah, such as those listed here as well. Okay, right? Uh, some of the learning resources, uh, uh, learning resources creation tool. For instance, if you have a lot of documents, yeah, you actually can use document sharing tools to upload it to the cloud, yeah, to share it with your learners, yeah. Or you can use some uh, audio recording tools, you know, create to create your audio or even to edit your audio, okay. And you can actually use some uh, presentation visuals too, yeah, to create your presentations. Yeah? Example here, you can use Google Slides. Yeah? You can use a uh, slide share, a uh, Haiku deck, a uh, speaker deck, a uh, Prezi, and so on and so forth. So this is an example of uh, tools that you can uh, use uh, to create your learning resources. Yeah? And you can also create infographics yeah, by using uh, tools such as Canva, Pixel Chart, you know, uh, Pixel Editor, Snackpart, Adobe Illustrator. You know? And this is just an example of what I meant by infographics. Yeah? So you can also create interactive content yeah, using tools such as Nearport. Uh, Tingling is a nice one. So here I'm uh, putting up two screenshots yeah, of interactive, uh, interactive contents yeah, created using Tingling. So here you actually only need to upload an image and then you can put a lot of hotspots on the image yeah, to create that interactive content yeah, for your learners. Or you can even create this 360 degrees video and create some uh, interactive hotspots yeah, within the video yeah, so that the video become very interactive for your students yeah, and insert learning. And later on, I think uh, Kiman is going to introduce you with another uh, two known sectors. Uh, known as a uh, add puzzle, okay, uh, uh, for creating interactive content as well, okay, and of course, where else can you get your uh, learning resources? Uh, you may just look for learning resources from other online educational platforms, yeah, like those listed here: Open Learning, Khan Academy, you know, Edmodo, Coursera, and so on and so forth. All right, okay. 
let's get back to our uh, third process yeah, in our direct teaching. Yeah? So in the third process, we mentioned that there is a need in our online learning design to provide some online learning activities to reinforce our students' learning. Yeah? So what will be the online affordances yeah, to uh, support this particular design? Yeah? We have discussion tools. We also have some brainstorming tools. We also have mind mapping tools that allow these learning activities to happen. Yeah? And uh, to provide a space for learners to demonstrate their learning, we actually have some gamification tools yeah, that allow us to create that, uh, that kind of possibilities. Yeah? So let's take a look at some of the discussion tools. So if we are using Ellipse, so very straightforward discussion forum would be one of the tools that you actually can use you know, to, uh, to do discussion. And of course, you can use a whole lot of this uh, discussion and brainstorming tools you know, that are available externally like for instance you can use pet uh, padlet you know uh, we are all very used uh, to it reclet lino mentimeter wooclap yeah kiman is going to demonstrate this as well uh, aha slides dot storming and garden and flip grid yeah so this is an example of the tools that you can use for that particular function yeah, to allow discussion and brainstorming among our students online okay and of course, we have tools yeah, that uh, also can help to reinforce learning, like mind mapping tools. Yeah? So you can uh, use tools like Poplet, you can use tools like Coggle, okay, easily, and also Mind Master in order to allow uh, your students to create digital mind maps yeah, using all these kinds of tools. And uh, in gamification tools, yeah, basically is uh, uh, to support our design where we said that we actually need to provide a space for learners to demonstrate their learning. Okay? So what are the gamification tools that we have? Within Elite, then you can actually use Quiz and you actually can use H5P. Yeah? You can actually explore this if you're uh, you not really familiar with this. Yeah? And gamification tools, external one we have a whole list of them Socrative, goal formative cohort these are all the very uh, common one that we are using we have quizzes quizlet game kit poll everywhere at puzzle mentimeter and aha slides and the list goes on okay so this is just some examples of gamification tools Right, so this table here basically lists out the three main steps that I mentioned just now for direct teaching. It's mapping to the online learning design and as well as it's mapping to the online affordances. Yeah? So hopefully you will get some idea. If you were to implement direct teaching online, then you have to consider this kind of design with this kind of possible online affordances. Yeah? Right, I will move on to the second strategy, which is on problem-based learning or PBL. Okay? So we all know in problem-based learning, uh, the instructor will actually pose uh, authentic, ill-structured problems yeah, to the learners. And uh, basically, uh, the reasons of uh, posing these problems is to promote student learning of concepts and principles yeah, by solving the problems, and usually it is done in group. Yeah? So this is actually very different from direct teaching yeah? because uh, in direct teaching, we talk about direct presentation of facts and concepts, but here in problem-based learning, we don't do it directly. We give students the problem, and when they actually solve the problem, they are constructing their knowledge yeah? in that particular uh, uh, subject matter. So it emphasizes knowledge acquisition, and the development of group collaboration as well as communication skills. Yeah? Now, uh, PBL is very popular in medical, uh, medical education, but now it is actually widely used across uh, disciplines. Yeah? So uh, unlike direct teaching, PBL is a learner-centered approach because learner is expected to actually construct their knowledge by participating in activities, uh, particularly when they try to uh, solve the problem that are actually posed to them, right? So here we could see that PBL is very constructivist in a way where uh, if that particular problem is meant for one single individual, individual students to solve, then it is actually following the constructivist paradigm. Yeah? But if it is actually involving a group of students, then it is actually following the social constructivist paradigm. Yeah? And most of the time, uh, tasks that are derived you know, for PBL is actually derived from the knowledge domain, okay? Right. So I have actually identified the, uh, the 
four main uh, steps in PBL process. Yeah? So the first step is that the instructor poses an authentic ill-structured problem. Yeah? That is the first step. And in the second step, the learners will explore the issue and research on possible solutions, yeah? Yeah, of, uh, solutions to the problem. So what is the role of the instructor then? The instructor provides guidance during this process. Yeah? In the third step, learners present and support their chosen solution. And finally, learners need to reflect on their performance. So these are the four steps that I identified for PBL process. So now I would like to do the same thing. I would like to map this PBL process to my online learning design. So the first step clearly that we actually in our online learning design, we need to pose the problem, right? So in the second step where the learners actually explore the issue and research on the possible, uh, possible solutions. So in my online learning design, I need to provide an online space you know, to afford generation of learning processes yeah? uh, so that uh, the students and you know, the learners can actually identify what is known and otherwise least possible solutions to the problem as well as formulate and test potential hypothesis, right? So the instructors then uh, need to provide guidance. So in our online learning design, we need to design in such a way that we actually can give guiding resources yeah, to our learners. Yeah? So in step three, learners are to present and support their chosen solution. So how do we do it online? We need to actually provide a space, an online space for peers to assess solutions. That's one thing. We also need to provide an online space for the learners to curate their constructed knowledge. Yeah? So because in PBL, what is important is actually we want to see how the learner construct their knowledge. Yeah? So our online space must actually afford that. Yeah? And we also need to provide a presentation space, online presentation space for the instructor to review our learners performance. Yeah? And finally, in step four, we can see that the learners need to reflect on their performance. So what do we need to do in our online learning environment? We need to provide a reflection space yeah, for future improvements. Yeah? So now if I further map it with the online for dancers, first step, pause the problem. Well, we can actually use the learning resources creation tools that I have uh, shown you just now uh, to present the problem either in the form of text, in the form of audio, video, or even in multimedia format, okay? Depends on your subject matter. Now, in the second step, we need to provide a space to afford generation of learning processes. So we can get back to use the tools that I have uh, mentioned to you just now, like discussion tools, like brainstorming tools that allow all this to happen, right? And the instructor provides uh, guidance by providing guiding resources. So instructor can use uh, document sharing tools, you know, to up upload some related resources you know, for the student's reference, or maybe provide some UR links, yeah, URL links you know, to external resources yeah, for students references, or even get some uh, resources from some existing online educational platforms. Yeah. Basically is to help the learners to explore the issue and to research on possible solutions. Yeah. So if I move on to step number three, there's a need for us to provide an online space for peers to assess uh, solutions. So means that the work in progress need to be shared and need to get feedback. Yeah? So some of the tools that allow us to do that, including discussion tools that I've mentioned just now. And if you are using Elip, you can use the database, the workshop tools you know, to allow this to happen. And as I mentioned, it's important for us to provide an online space for learners to curate their constructed knowledge. Yeah? So in order to do so, you can use mind map tools. Yeah? Students can create their own mind maps. Yeah? Uh, they can uh, use an e-portfolio tools to create their e-portfolio. And even you can uh, use a content curation tools yeah, for the uh, students yeah, to use. Yeah? So now the next one is provide an online presentation space. So how can you allow your students to present online. You can uh, get them to use some presentation visual tools to correct you know, the presentation visuals, or you can get them to actually screen record you know, whatever that they want to present. Or if you, can, uh, you do have good bandwidth, then you actually can allow 
virtual conferencing tools by having the students doing some kind of live presentations. Yeah. So uh, just to give a bit of a uh, 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 little bit of examples yeah, of the tools yeah, to support, uh, sorry, um, get back a bit, right. Uh, so if it's an elite, yeah, you can actually use database and workshop too. And this kind of tools will allow you to provide an online space for peers to assess uh, solutions. Yeah, that's one thing. And uh, the next one would be um, content curation and e-portfolio tools. What are the examples of content curation and e-portfolio tools? Yeah, for well, content curation, you may can use a blank space, seesaw, regular. Yeah, you can also ask them to create a, a nice digital flip book. Yeah, by using applications such as uh, any flip or even flip snack. Yeah, and uh, you can also ask them to create some uh, websites yeah, as e-portfolio by using uh, tools such as Wix and WordPress. Yeah? Of course, once again, the list is not exhaustive. Right? Okay, to provide a presentation space just now, we mentioned how can we allow our students to present online. We can ask them to create some presentations visuals using this kind of tool. You can ask them to create infographics yeah, by using this kind of tools. Yeah, so I've uh, shown you the tools just now because some of these tools are actually used by the instructor to create their learning resources. But similar tools can be used by students to create their own content as well. Yeah, so remember, Tools are meant for the instructor to create resources, to create activities but, activities, but at the same time, the same tools can be used by students to create their content and to create their own activities as well, right? So uh, virtual conferencing tools, yeah, you can allow them to use this kind of tools if you want to do live presentation, or they can use the same screen recording tools that you use to create your recording, yeah, your recorded lecture, yeah, your recorded teaching. You can actually use, uh, uh, get the students to use the same uh, screen recording tools to correct their presentation, all right? So, and finally, we have the fourth step, provide a reflection space. So the online affordance would be, we need to provide reflection tools, yeah? So example, a reflection tool, if you are using Elip, you have this journal, right? Uh, but you also have some external tools like Goal Sync, yeah, which allows you to uh, give reflection through audio. Or you can have a Padlet and Recollet that allows you to give reflection uh, in various formats, in text, in image, or even in multimedia format. And Flipgrid is basically to give a reflection in the form of a video, okay? So uh, basically this table, summarizes what I've talked about just now. The four steps, uh, it's mapping to the online learning design as well as it's mapping to the uh, various online affordances. Huh? Right, so with this, uh, I would like to pass my session over to Kiman uh, so that he can actually demonstrate some tools to all of you. Yeah? All right, I'll pass over to you, Kiman. Thank you, Prof Chen, for the a coverage of the two strategies, like teaching and also problem-based learning. Um, what I will do now is to pick two tools, one for direct teaching and one for problem-based learning for uh, for you to kind of consider in planning your uh, direct teaching and uh, problem-based learning. So um, I will go to my slide for a while. Hope you can see my slide, okay. Oops, sorry. He went a bit off. All right, let, let's, you know, uh, Prof Chen covered direct teaching and also problem-based learning just now. So what I will do is uh, I will pick one for direct teaching and one for PBL, else we have no time to cover everything. You know, there's so many tools out there. But I want you to bear in mind, uh, when we talk about tools, you have to consider what kind of activities uh, that you are planning to do, then um, check whether the tool can supplement the strategies or the the activities that you plan to do. All right. First one, uh, as mentioned by um, Prof Chen, is direct teaching. Now, before I even go to the tool, I want you to take a look at these four types of typical uh, live teaching or even pre-recorded video that you see uh, in many, many online courses. I purposely pick um, mathematics and sciences because everyone always um, you know, they always come to me and say, how do you teach maths online? How do you teach science online? We have so many to, to demonstrate, we have so many practical things to, to show. I said, 
if you are sitting here like me now and then telling people how to do or operate certain thing, how to do a certain calculation, then it won't work. So you still have to redo some readjustment. For example, instead of using a webcam facing yourself talking like this, you might want to reposition the camera a bit and make use of your uh, whiteboard or whatever board you have. That's one method, the usual teaching position. In fact, the first one is kind of effective, even though you you may think that it's a bit you know far, but actually, if you look at the you know the, the resolution of the screen is quite clear actually. All right, um, people can actually still uh, uh, how to put it, uh, see whatever you're writing, and somehow students love it. This has 15 million views on YouTube, by the way. And then the another type is screencast and webcam. This is also very popular. Um, you can do your uh, you know screencasting of uh, whatever calculation you have or equation you have and then show your face explaining it side by side, like what we are looking at now. You know, you have the screen and also me talking. Uh, this is useful if your expression or your handling of certain things matters in um, explaining certain calculation or explaining certain uh, formulas, or else you can turn it off, like what happened here, uh, screencast only. This is very famous in Han Academy. If you have uh, visit hanacademy.org, you will see most of Han's videos are like this because the emphasis is on the explanation through voice and also to visual you know scribbling of the the formulas not so much about your face not so much about you doing um uh, through camera and then of course the, another one is live for recorded demonstration this is um, professor walter if you know him uh, he is very famous in youtube as well uh, doing a lot of demonstration uh, live and then ask somebody to record it so this is one way to actually do your uh, recording. Um, instead of uh, you know uh, doing screencasting, you can also do live demonstration. Very useful for practical skills demonstration. But the whole point is show and uh, not reading from the slide. Let me tell you, all these four examples here are all less than 15 minutes, 15 minutes. But when you go and watch the video, you will be amazed by the amount of knowledge amount of things that you learn in 15 minutes but if you ask students to go online and teach live for three hours all you did is just readings from slide one to slide 10 then the student will just give up halfway so it's not about how long you teach online or live it's how meaningful it is during that period of time so one way to do this is to make use of this screencasting tool that i will introduce a bit i, I will not demonstrate step by step because we don't have time to cover everything, just to introduce you to Loom. Some of you may, ha uh, may have heard of it. There's so many sc uh, screencasting software out there. You have screen uh, Screencast-O-Matic, you have Loom, you have Screencastify and all that. But my favorite is Loom because currently Loom allows unlimited features until July because of this uh, pandemic. So they allow free unlimited usage until July. So it's the right time, yeah, if it's about two months now, you can make use of these two months to create your content um, on the fly, very simple. Just install Loom on your Chrome. You don't, need that, uh, you don't have to download the application on your Windows or Mac, just install it in your Chrome, activate it, and then launch your slides or whatever you want to show them, visuals, calculation, and whatnot, and do the explanation as you, um, you know, show the materials, all right? So there's a few modes. You have screen, car, uh, screen and cam, screen only, and also camera only. Of course, we do encourage you to have this small face here because it gives that human touch all right sometimes because if if you're reading from the slides and then or you're just explaining from the slide might as well just put the slides with the voice rather than the, the face right something for you to consider i don't have time to cover step by step but i gave the link here uh, for those who are asking for slides and all that it will give you but you can go to this links a very, a very useful guide on you how to start off with zoom right that's that's for direct teaching then we go for problem-based learning. Um, problem-based learning, I want you to participate a bit because one of the key things that I always get uh, about having that kind of interaction when you do live teaching or when you do uh, you know, interactive teaching in, in classes even, not, not just online setting, even in your class, you can do this. Okay, I want you to uh, go to this link now for a while. I think we have time, so. Can we just quickly, if you have, if you're on your laptop, for those who can, I mean, if you can't, don't worry, don't, don't, don't have to feel bad about it. Uh, just go to uh, this link. 
wooplab.com slash CLMWEB. Let me just type it in the uh, chat box. See a lot of chat going on. All right, wooclap.com slash CLM web. Okay. If you have, if you're on your laptop, if you are using a mobile phone, then maybe it's very hard for you to leave the phone, you know, for another view. It's okay. If you're on your laptop, just open another tab. As you're listening to me, just go to this link, right? Oops, sorry, I haven't started yet. Okay. Rob, well, you should see a few the first question now. This is just a kickstart, all right? Imagine if you do live teaching, if you're doing live teaching, this is one way to engage your students or even your participant in webinars or whatever. Amazing how you can actually show like real time, you know, polling questions and all that. So what, how is it relevant to PBL? Because in PBL, there's a lot of activity going on. You know, you have to talk about the problem. You have to discuss about the trigger. You have to have a space to reflect and all that. And WooClap has a lot of component inside where you can make use of them, not only to get, you know, some simple question like this, you can also trigger a lot of deeper conversation, right? Thank you for those who are responding now. Very good. I have very good students with me today. Everyone is very responsive. I wish all my students are like this, <laughs> but nah, it's okay. Try this out. You'll be amazed. You know, sometimes when you do a simple poll in class, nobody bothered to answer. The moment you use this, everyone start answering. All right? If they have a very, you know, if they have good connection. All right. Okay. All right. We have a lot of awesome people. Good. So, so I don't have any that can come into place when you use WooClap. Those of you who have not answered, it's okay. Don't feel bad about this. This one, huh? Suddenly, I pop up with a very, you know, very tough question. <laughs> Andrea in this heaven in his research on self-regulated learners found that those who set no goals of improvement achieve no change and are outperformed by those who set themselves challenging goals. So Bandura said, those who have no goals at all tend to have no improvement, right? That they have no improvement, and those who have set a challenging goal, they tend to improve over, uh, you know, very fast. So, in this sense, what can be done to motivate people to set better goals? Imagine if before this, I already post a trigger, which is a complete trigger, but before they go deeper into the trigger, I want them to reflect on what they have read. Because sometimes in PBL, it's good to relate to the learning material or reading material first, so that they don't go over, you know, go too far, right? You want them to discuss within a specific scope not somewhere just around the globe or you know around the moon and come back no this is one way to do that now if you if you look at the uh, the column that you can post sorry um if you look at the column that you can post you can try and uh, post now you should be able to see something like this when you're posting right you can you can choose whether you want to say it's internal motivation external motivation or addiction let's say you have three categories that you want them to uh, give their views on this is where the learner will post their comment according to the the category internal motivation external motivation and addiction if you realize this is what we normally do in class use, using sticky notes and marjong paper you know large marjong paper or whiteboard where we use sticky notes and we start asking students to post their, their, you know, whatever ideas they have based on the question, right? So um, so let me just quickly check through. So in WooClap, you can see some already, you know, posted some some uh, some command, which is very nice. I have a lot of nice command. And I like this Kiasunas. <laughs> Kiasunas is one problem. Yeah, true, right? You're addicted to winning, then you'll be improving very, very fast. Very true, very true. I like that. Now, in um, in WooClub, you can do this, right? If you um, if you put it in a grid like this, right, you can view everything. If you put it in category, then you will see in category, right? This is one way, again, to engage your learners when you're doing live teaching. Imagine uh, you can do this for, for quite some time, right? And, and it's quite interesting. And let's say you... 
once you stop soon from posting later, you can stop it. And then you can do the discussion now, right? We can discuss with the class, you know, Let, let's take a look at the first one. What do you think? If it's not suitable, then we move them. The moment you move, it changes color to that particular category. This is one thing really, really wonderful about WooClub that you should try. I think that's all for WooClub and uh, Loom. So if you want, just explore WooClub through the link uh, given down there, all right? And um, I'm gonna pass to Prof Chen again. All right, well, I'll see you again for the next two strategies. Let me stop share first, okay. Then. Hey, thank you, Kiman. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I'm going to continue with the next two strategies. So the first one is uh, inquiry-based learning, okay? So in inquiry-based learning, what is important is the instructor will pose questions, yeah? and sometimes it could be in a form of problem or maybe scenario, and basically uh, is to encourage a learner exploration of it. Yeah? So the learners will actually ask more questions, they will share their ideas, and they are actually expected to answer their own questions yeah, during that process. So knowledge acquisitions occurs by getting learners to connect it with their existing knowledge through creative and critical thinking, all right? So inquiry-based learning is once again a very learner-centered approach, yeah? And uh, it follows the constructivist paradigm. It is used in a single individual students, but it follows the social constructivist uh, paradigm if you actually involve a group of students solving the questions, yeah? And most of the time, the tasks are actually derived from the knowledge domain. And of course, there are various types of inquiries that the instructor can pose. Yeah? It could be an open query, structured inquiry, guided inquiry, and confirmation inquiry. Uh, today, I'm not going to delve uh, deeper into all these different types of inquiries. Yeah? I have no time for that. And uh, the very uh, things that I'm going to highlight here is the steps that are involved in inquiry-based learning. There are four main steps that are identified. The first one is the instructor need to pose the questions. Basically, is to trigger the learner's curiosity. Yeah, that's the first thing. And secondly, learners are expected to explore the questions. They are expected to ask their own questions. They are expected to research uh, the topic, share their ideas, and answer their own questions. So what is the role of instructor? provide guidance throughout this process. Yeah? So in the third step, learners present their constructed knowledge yeah? because this is a very constructivist approach, learners constructing their knowledge through these activities. And finally, learners will actually reflect yeah, on their learning process. Yeah? So these are the four steps in inquiry-based learning. So once again, the same thing, I'm going to map this to the online learning design. Well, posing a problem, or sorry, posing a question, or it could be a problem or scenario, you have to trigger the curiosity. So in my online learning design, I need to pause it, right? Okay. Now, in the second steps, learner explore the questions, right? So uh, ask their own questions, research the topic, share the ideas and answer their own questions. So in my online learning design, it is important for me to provide an online space for group learning to allow them to actually ask questions, to allow them to share their ideas. Yeah? And uh, the instructor provides guidance. So in my online learning environment, I need to actually provide guidance yeah, so that my students or my learners can actually research correctly. Okay? Now, the third step, learner present their constructed knowledge. So the same thing in my online learning design, I need to provide an online space to allow my students to present what has been learned. Yeah? And finally, they need to reflect on their learning process. So we need to actually provide an online space for reflection, okay? So further down, if I were to further map it to the online for dancers, so if to pause a problem, same thing, you can actually present in the form of text, audio, video, or multimedia, and you can use learning resources, creation tools, you know, to correct all this, yeah? Next, uh, provide a space 
for group learning. You can actually use discussion tools. Yeah, you can use brainstorming tools to provide that particular space. Provide guidance to students to research correctly. Maybe you want to upload some documents. Yeah, you may want to share some URL, or maybe you want to get some uh, related uh, resources. Yeah, from some existing. Uh, educational platforms. Yeah? You actually can do that and to provide a space to present what have been learned. Once again, you can allow the students to use presentation visual tools, screen recording tools, and virtual conferencing tools. Yeah? So uh, almost the same like what we have uh, mentioned uh, uh, previously in the previous strategies on PBL. Yeah? So provide a space for reflection. Well, uh, usually, the students will provide a uh, produce journal, yeah. So you can use some reflection tools for this, yeah. So now, basically, uh, I do not have new categories of tools, yeah, to be uh, shared with you, yeah, for inquiry based learning. It seems like most of the categories of tools that we have used here is actually similar to the one that I've introduced in direct teaching as well as in problem based learning, yeah. So this. Uh, table summarizes the four steps. So I'm going to move on to the next uh, teaching strategy, which is on POPBL, Project Oriented Problem Based Learning. Okay, so POPBL is actually a very systematic uh, teaching approach yeah, where it encourages uh, learner explorations of the problem through a very uh, systematic project. Yeah, so usually the uh, instructor will pose us. Uh, Problems that are, that are complex, authentic, and ill-structured, yeah? and requires the learners to use their knowledge and skills to solve the problem. So you see in PBL just now, problem-based learning, we only require knowledge. But a lot of time in PO PBL, it requires both knowledge and skills. Yeah? And usually it is done in time and over a period of time. Yeah? So the learners also will need to employ some proper project management process in order to ensure the project can be implemented successfully. And ultimately, we have some tangible output. Yeah? It could be in the form of product, software, application, or it could be in the form of performance. Yeah? So now, learner-centered approach. Yeah? Of course, POPBL is very learner-centered, and it follows the social constructivist paradigm. And uh, usually, the tasks are derived from the knowledge as well as the skills domain. Okay? Now, POPBR process, I have identified five important steps. The first step is the instructor conveys pedagogic intentions and project team. Okay? That's the first step. The second step, learners plan the project yeah so the whole idea is about the project so the planning part is actually important and instructor provides guidance during this planning of the project phase the third uh, step is learners start implementing the project right and then step number four learners revise the project and finally in step number five learners present the tangible output of the project okay so these are the five steps. So if I were to map it to the online learning design, okay, one-to-one -one mapping. So instructor conveys the pedagogy intentions. Well, in my online learning environment, I need to do the same thing. I need to convey the intentions and the project team. Okay. So second step, allowing the learners to plan. Well, I need to actually provide an online space for the learners to curate their resources because to plan their project, they need to have a lot of references, resources. Then the instructor will provide the guiding resources. And as I mentioned just now, project management is important. So it is also good if we actually can provide a project management space, yeah? an online project management space for our learners. So the third step is learners implement the project. So what I would like to highlight here is the project implementation may occur using computer, online, okay? Or in some, uh, some subject matters, sometimes it actually requires some physical ob uh, objects or physical spaces. Uh, in that kind of uh, situation or in that kind of subject matters, yeah, this project implementation may need to occur offline. Okay? So learners start to revise the project, okay, where in my online learning design, we need to provide an online space to keep and to share the work in progress. Yeah? And as 
as an instructor, we need to provide constructive uh, feedback yeah, during the process yeah, to the work in progress. Yeah? And finally, learners will present the tangible output. So you provide an online space for them to present the output, right? So if I want to map with the online affordances, for the first step, you uh, instructor need to convey the intentions and project team. So this intention and project team can actually present it in either text, audio, video, or multi for, uh, multimedia format. And you can actually use some learning resources creation tools. Yeah? So in the second step, we need to provide space for learners to curate their resources. Yeah? So how can learners create their, their resources? We can use some social bookmarking tools. Yeah? You can also ask them to use uh, content curation tools yeah, for them to curate their resources. Yeah? So instructor providing guiding resources. So these are the examples that I have shown previously and provide a project management space. Yeah? So in the online affordances would be to provide some online project management tools yeah, to actually support this design. Okay? Now, here I'm showing you some uh, social bookmarking tools yeah, that our students can use. For instance, we have Papali, yeah, you have uh, Evernote uh, with a uh, web clipper, or you can use, ask the students to use Digo. So these are examples of social bookmarking tools, which basically allows the learners, not just individual learners, but a group of learners to collaboratively curate digital resources. They can actually bookmark the digital resources that they found, okay, and share with each other. So this is what we call social bookmarking tools, yeah. And of course, we have some project management tools as well. So these are some examples of project man uh, management tools that you can ask your students or your learners to use. Example, we have Trello, we have a clip, a clip app, and also we have an open project. Yeah? Open project is actually a rather comprehensive uh, project management tools yeah? that allow things like project planning and scheduling, task management, team collaboration, time tracking, budget planning, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so you can actually provide that kind of uh, space yeah, for your students to manage their projects. Yeah? So if we move on to step number three, okay, online evidences, I cannot solicit it because it really depends on your subject matter. Okay, right. And uh, for step number four, provide a space to keep and share work in progress. We, we can use e-portfolio tools. Yeah, for them to create what we call learning e-portfolio because this is work in progress. So it's actually learning e-portfolio and to provide constructive feedback. Well, as an instructor, how can you actually give feedback to students work in progress? You can use live feedback. You can use virtual conferencing tools yeah, to give your live feedback or you can actually use recorded video or audio or even text. Uh, feedback. Yeah? Some of the discussion tools that uh, I've shown you just now can actually be used for this particular purposes. Yeah? Now, the next thing is in step number five, yeah, the last step, yeah, you need to provide a space for them to present the output. Okay, So you can allow live presentation, as I mentioned earlier on, can use virtual conferencing tools for that. Yeah, you can use, uh, you can get them to record the video, you know, of the output that have produced uh, and use some video editing tools, yeah, to make it nice, yeah, uh, presentable. Or you can actually uh, ask them to create what we call augmented reality poster presentation by using some augmented reality tools, yeah. So these are some examples of augmented reality tools, yeah, that you actually can use and you actually can ask your students to use, yeah? Like for instance, you have RT5, you have Blipa, Euphoria, Zapwork, okay? So this is an example of augmented reality tool, which I think is very nice you know, for them to present their yeah, project, okay? Now, so, uh, this table here basically summarizes yeah, the five steps that I mentioned to you just now, okay? So with this, uh, once again, I pass the session over to Kiman, right, Kiman? Thank you, Prof Chen. Good to see all of you again. So I'm gonna continue from my slide just now. Okay. Before I go further, just in case you're wondering why did I you know, arrange the tool according to the strategy? Because just to align with what uh, Prof Chen is uh, telling you or explaining it to you. Basically the tools can be used for other strategies as well. Uh, you just have to fit into what you want to achieve within each strategy that um, 
Prof Chen has mentioned. So let's say within a strategy, you need to have reflection, then you can go for that reflection tool. If you need screencasting, then you go for the screencasting. But I'm showing you in, in progression so that it's easier to follow, right? Don't worry about that. Okay, uh, for this part, um, I'm going to introduce you to AppBuzzer. I know a lot of people know this. Uh, some of you may not know, especially those who have, um, you know, have not explored uh, Google Classroom because this is integrated in Google Classroom. If you have, this is one way to encourage inquiry or curiosity. Um, um, sometimes in in, um, in query-based learning, you need to trigger the curiosity, right? One of the best ways is to use a very short clip video. You don't have to find a lengthy one. Um, just use AdPuzzle. And um, one thing good about AdPuzzle is it immediately curate Creative Commons video, meaning no copyright issue at all. It comes from all the open learning and as well as open uh, resources that you can use. So the moment you search through AdPuzzle, the videos are all okay, unless you upload your own video, which may be copyrighted, that will be an issue. But I do, I do encourage you to search from the database or resources. What you can do is, what, what um, AdPuzzle can do is, uh, you can pause the video, let's say this one is about coronavirus. So somewhere along the line, you want to test whether the students have uh, actually watched the video. You can post a question on the video and they cannot continue until they answer the question. All right. So you can actually set, you know, open-ended question. You can set MCQ. You can even do your own voiceover. For example, this video is in English uh, about coronavirus. You might think that the student may not understand. So you voice over your explanation in Malay. Then it, it, it feels like you are explaining the video as well. So that would be one tool to use if you want to encourage a learner to have that curiosity before they go further. So um, again, I, I will not demonstrate one by one or step by step. You can go to these two links. I have English and Malay. You can go for the English version and the Malay version. This is not from me. Some, some tutorials are from the sources that I found quite useful. So you can go and check it out. So AppBuzzer is quite popular. If um, another thing is you can also find out how many people have used this video. So once you go to AppBuzzer, if you use use if you use this video, you scroll down, you'll be able to see other teachers or other educators who have used the same video, and you can check what kind of question did they ask and perhaps encourage uh, kind of like uh, your your idea in uh, generating questions. All right, this is one. Next one is POBBL or Project Oriented Problem Based Learning. Um, I want to introduce you. This is a very nice uh, tool called ClipUp. Click up, right? A clip up, or, or if you if you want to call it click up, it's okay. I know a lot of you are familiar with uh, Trello, right? T R E L O Trello, but um, I personally think Clip Up is a challenge. As it's a direct challenge to Trello. Why? Because it comes with more features that um, you know Trello doesn't have. So uh, what you can do is just go to ClipUp dot com and get yourself an account try to explore this is one example of what i did for example for my uh, final year project student now this is just a mock by the way not a, uh, not like a properly done but just to show you how you can do it if you click on the board then it becomes like the trello view right the card. so but if you're looking for a platform as a backup for whatever lms that you are using in your university in your schools or in your um, in your uh, uh, organization, this is one uh, good platform to start because you can even create classes, you can even create, uh, you know, tasks, assignment for them to submit, they can even submit here. Right now, it's still free, um, you know, for, for usage, they still, they still have free account. So I'm not sure how long, but you can, you know, try it out. I think this is the approach that they are doing now, like free, and then you, you, you pay if you want some premium features. All right, uh, I think that's all for my part. Before we move to see, I'm gonna pass back to Prof Chen. Okay, thank you, Kiman. Share my screen first. All right. Okay, the next teaching strategy that I'm gonna talk about is studio-based learning, SBL. Okay, so, in student-based learning, learning happens best when we have small group of learners uh, work under the tutelage of an instructor, right? And uh, learners tackle problems 
on their own while the instructor reviews their work and coach them. A lot of critics yeah, from the instructor yeah, to help them to improve their project or their problem, yeah, solutions to their problems. And learning is afforded via peer-to-peer -peer as well as a tutor or instructor-to-peer uh, learning communities. Yeah? So uh, in student, uh, sorry, student best learning is uh, popular in architecture, design, engineering, and creative performance arts, all right? And it's, of course, it's a very learner-centered approach that follows the social constructivist paradigm yeah, because a group of learners trying to construct their knowledge yeah, through the learning activities. And usually the tasks are derived also from the domain of knowledge as well as skills. Yeah? Now, uh, I have identified uh, five important steps in SPL. First step, learners work on complex and demanding projects. That's one thing. Second step, learners interact okay, with each other okay, when needed yeah, on their project. And third step, learners implement the project. Yeah. Fourth step, oh, this is quite unique to SPL. Learners undergo periodic critics yeah, of their project from their instructor as well as from their peers. And uh, the instructor provides comments and guidance yeah so in the final step learners will present their work yeah? usually uh, to the public okay now so if i want to map the steps to the online learning design so learners work on complex and demanding projects so you have to post the project expectation online okay learners interact with each other so you provide a collaborative online space for each group of learners, yeah, so that they can actually interact with each other. You're yeah, doing their group project. So learners implement their project. So you have to provide a collaborative, yeah, online collaborative working space for the learners. So once again, I would like to highlight implementation may occur online. For instance, if you uh, requires the students to do some computer design work, then they actually can do it using their computer. Yeah, but otherwise, they may need to have some um, special physical spaces or physical objects yeah, in order to implement the projects offline. Okay? Now, learners undergo periodic uh, critics of their project yeah, from the instructors and peers. So there's a need for us to provide an online space to present an ongoing work. Okay? Can only involve selected groups yeah, in this case. And the instructors need to provide feedback. And sometimes the instructor will provide some mini teaching yeah? and also provide some related resources yeah? during this step number four. And finally, provide a space for the learners to present their final work. Okay, okay so mapping to the online affordances, posing the project expectation. So you are all very familiar by now. You can use the learning resources creation tools yeah, to present the project uh, expectation. Uh, then uh, in the second step, provide a collaborative space for each group of learners. Can use discussion tools for that. Can use brainstorming tools for that as well. Okay and provide a collaborative online uh, working space. Yeah? So now you can actually use another category of tool known as collaborative workspace tools. Yeah? So these are examples of collaborative workspace tools that you can use, like Miro. I think Kiman is going to introduce you with uh, Miro later on. You can also use uh, uh, ask the students to use Google Meet or even uh, Trello. Okay? So these are just examples of uh, online collaborative workspace tools. All right, so step number four, need to provide an online space for the learners to present ongoing work, okay? So you can ask them to create e-learning e-portfolio by using e-portfolio tools, or you can ask them to use a presentation visual tools, a screen recording tools, or virtual conferencing tools to show their ongoing work, okay, from time to time. So as an instructor, you may need to provide feedback. So as I mentioned just now, you can provide live feedback or sometimes you may need to do some mini teaching. Yeah? So same thing, you can use virtual conferencing tools if you want to do it live or you want to do a recorded version of it, you may use some uh, discussion tools. Yeah? Also to provide uh, learning resources, once again, you can use document sharing, URL links and even online educational platforms. Yeah? Getting some resources on those platforms. Yeah? And finally, to present their work, okay, 
So you need to provide an online space to do so. So you can ask them to create showcase e-portfolio. Yeah, that's the final work that the students want to show by using some e-portfolio tools. Or you can ask them to create video or augmented reality visualizations. And because you want to do it, uh, you want to show it to the public. Yeah, so you can also make use of the social networking tools. Yeah. So examples of social networking tools, students can share their work over the Facebook, okay? Share their work over Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Flickr, even WhatsApp, you know, YouTube, Telegram, Tumblr, and so on and so forth. So this will allow the students to share it with the public, okay? Now, uh, this particular table once again summarizes the five steps of SVL. It's mapping to the online learning design and finally with the online affordances, okay? So the next strategies that I'm going to talk about okay, is case-based learning, CBL. So case-based learning, basically the instructor will employ a case. Okay? Usually it's factually based case or complex real-world problem. Yeah? Return in a way to stimulate discussion and collaborative analysis. So the case usually have a various interpretation or solutions to the problems. Yeah. So usually students are asked to solve it in small groups. Yeah. And they devise solutions with the guidance from the instructor. So uh, very popular in business and law. They are getting all the real cases, but now it's actually used across uh, different disciplines. Yeah. Uh, Learner-centered approach, of course, uh, follows the constructivist paradigm if it is done individually. But if it involves group of students, then it actually follows the social uh, constructivist paradigm. And the tasks are often involved, uh, are often derived yeah, from the knowledge domain. Okay? Unlike SPL just now, studio based learning, it will involve both knowledge and skills. Yeah? But case based learning, most of the time, is that, uh, it's just uh, derived from the knowledge domain. Okay? So, how many steps are there in CBL? I have identified uh, four important steps. Yeah? The first step, instructor poses a factually best case or complex problem. Okay, that's the first step. Second, you expect the learners to discuss and analyze the case. Third step, learners defend their solutions. So instructor's role is to facilitate the case exploration. And finally, learners will submit their solutions, right? Okay, so the mapping is straightforward. Pause the case in the online learning design. Provide an online space for each group to support discussion and analysis of the group in the second step. In the third step, you need to provide a space for the students to present the solutions because they need to defend the solutions. Okay, so uh, once again, the instructor comes in to provide continuous guide and feedback. And finally, the students will provide uh, their final solutions, submit their final solutions. So in our online space, we need to provide a submission space. Yeah? So now, the, map, uh, the mapping to the online affordances. So posing the case once again, okay, it's very similar. You can actually use some learning resources creation tools, but a lot of the time uh, the case uh, is presented in text. Yeah? And uh, sometimes uh, you can also get some existing uh, resources where you just have to upload those cases because those cases are actually real world cases. So sometimes you actually can only link yeah, to those particular cases yeah, for the students to refer to. Okay? Now, uh, learner discuss, of course, you need to provide an online space to support that. Can use discussion tools, uh, brainstorming tools, mind mapping tools. So these are all the tools that can allow discussion and analysis. Yeah? So by now, you should have a good idea on how the mapping is done, right? Okay, providing a space to present solutions. Well, familiar with these categories of tools? I believe so, because these are all repeated. Yeah? So if you want them to present, you actually can use this kind of categories of tools. And to provide feedback, you can actually give live feedback by using virtual conferencing tool, or you can give recorded feedback by using some uh, discussion tools. Yeah? And finally, the students will submit their uh, solutions. So we need to provide an online submission space. Yeah? So we have some online submission tools here, different category of tools. So how can you allow uh, students or learners to submit online? Of course, you can use the assignment function, the workshop function, or even the turn it in assignment function in Elite, yeah? Or you can use some uh, external tools as well, yeah? Right, so with this, uh, I am summarizing. 
the four steps in case-based learning and its mapping to the online learning design as well as the online evidences. Yeah? So get back to you, Kiman. Okay, thank you, Prof Chen. I'm gonna go back to my part. Okay. So for studio-based uh, learning, one of the best tool that um, you know Prof Chen has mentioned just now is Miro. Uh, I don't know whether you have heard of this. If you are into whiteboarding, you want to scribble on things, you want to put your slides there, and then start to do a lot of mind mapping, you know, sticky note command. This is the best tool so far that I can find for you. All right. So um, if we go to Miro now, once you sign in for Miro, again, when we introduce you tools, um, we are not asking you to use these tools for your teaching directly. You can always introduce the tool to your students. Let them use it and create something in the tool and then send it to you rather than you use it in your, you know, try to burden yourself with so many different tools in, in one page. Tools that we introduce you, you can also ask your learners to use it and then um, share the content or share the output with you as part of activities or e even part of uh, assessment. Now in Miro, if you have not used it before, just sign up. Um, it allows any tree board, live board. You can always delete and then create new one. It has several templates for you to work on. Uh, uh, they have Kanban framework and mind mapping and, and all that. Um, I will not go into step by step, but I'll just show you immediately. This is one example of how, for example, in an art class, okay. For example, in an art class, you can um, kind of like, wait, huh? let me zoom in a bit. Okay, I don't know whether you can see the full, full view, but if you go into um, Miro, it's like a canvas or whiteboarding where you can add a lot of tools in, um, you know, inside. This is a template. Now imagine this is an art management uh, course where you know uh, you want student to plan some event or you know practice how to plan certain uh, showcase or whatever. So they can use this template if they want to. So they can start planning, and then make use of the sticky note to 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 make some uh, you know brainstorming and and whatnot. Uh, you know, I just type here location and all that. If you don't want to use the template, you can always start blank, right? But it has a very nice uh, scribbling tool. Let's say I have this scribbling tool now. Let's say this is your student work. You, you ask the student to add you into their particular Miro, and then you can start scribbling, right? Or maybe, you know, you can just start commenting. You can even put command here. Just put it here. Please think carefully. For example, just put your command there, right? There's so many things you can do in Miro. You can even uh, put an arrow to tell them something to be considered. Let's say you can just point it here, right? Something like that. So it's like a virtual working space where you can use it for multiple purposes. One of the things that I can think of is studio-based learning where if let's say you're doing some practical um, uh, work and all that, student can always record it in a video and share it here in YouTube. And it also has several features like presentation. It also has screencasting to itself. So Miro itself, if you use it, Miro or Miro, you can do it in live class mode as well. Like now, if you do a Zoom session, instead of putting the slides on, you can use this as a platform to scribble, to write, to, to command, and even to showcase uh, different material on the same whiteboarding, all right? So see, this is Miro. Okay, let me go back to the slide just now. So if you want to know further, you can just go to the link down there, is.gd slash Miro guide, uh, Miro guide, whatever you call it. I actually explained step by step how you can use this and many templates that you can use, but try to consider this as one of the whiteboarding tools that you can use, right? Next tool for case-based learning is this is very popular as well, Flipgrid. Use it as a case-based study where Student can provide responses in, in terms of uh, you know, issues or related cases in the form of video. 
So normally when it comes to, uh, you know, reflection or responses, we want them to write, right? And um, sometimes it's not that, um, you know, engaging. So we can always ask them to do a video reflection or video response in a short uh, manner. It can be 60 seconds like this one I gave to uh, PGD uh, participants. Most of them are lecturers. I, I was surprised all, all 32 of them actually submitted. Uh, in 90 seconds, they have to share a response to uh, a, a case that I brought up. So uh, so Flip Grip is a good tool for you to try. You can go to the uh, link down there. I know some of you have tried Flip Grip. Uh, Flip, Flip Grip. If um, you have students with poor internet connection, then you might not want to consider this. But if you have students who are able to connect, then you can try giving tasks or activities using Flip Grip, right? So I think um, that's all from me. I'm going to pass it back to Prof, uh, Prof Chen. Hey, thanks again, Kiman. All right, I'll just share my screen again. Okay, I guess these are the last two teaching strategies. Uh, challenge uh, best learning uh, basically is very challenging where it requires the instructors and the learners to actually work collaboratively. And they work collaboratively to learn about compelling real world issues. There must be real world. And in the context of their uh, educational institution, uh, family, or even local community. Yeah? So they propose, learners will propose solutions to real problems, not only solutions, they actually need to tackle action so that they can actually bring impact to the targeted groups yeah therefore challenge based uh, learning is really very challenging yeah and uh, finally uh, learners are required to reflect on their learning and also widely share their solutions yeah so basically uh, uh, we know that uh, from the description just now challenge based learning is very learner centered and it follows the social constructivist paradigm and tasks are usually derived from the knowledge and skills domain, okay? Now, how many steps do you think are there in challenge-based uh, learning? It's not four steps. I actually identified nine steps, yeah? so a lot. Right, so in the first step, instructor introduces uh, uh, challenge-based learning to learners and set up the challenge, that's the first thing, okay? Second, learners tackle real-world issues in the context of their educational institutions, family, or local community. Third thing, learners produce the challenge uh, proposal. Yeah? The following step is that learners generate sets of questions yeah, to guide their search for solutions. Step number five, learners need to produce the research plan and the timeline. Yeah? So instructor will guide uh, this process. And step number six, learners implement the solutions. Step number seven, learners evaluate the solutions. Number eight, learners present the solution to the world or to the public. And finally, learners will need to do their learning uh, reflection. Okay, so these are the nine steps. So the mapping is actually one-to-one. -one. So step number one, in the online learning design, need to explain the expectation. And usually it's also good to provide an interaction space for the learners uh, to get clarification on the uh, expectation yeah, from the instructor. Second, uh, to allow the learners to tackle real world issues. As an instructor, there is a need for us to provide some guiding resources to help them to identify those real world issues. And then for the learners to produce the challenge proposal, in our online learning environments, do provide a collaborative working space, do provide an online space for learners to present their ideas and the big challenge, eh, the challenge. And uh, the fourth uh, step is basically uh, getting the learners to generate a set of questions. So provide an online space for the group to discuss, to brainstorm on the set of questions, right? So step number five, they start to do their research plan, you know, their timeline. So therefore, we need to provide an online space to, uh, for them to prepare their research plan and also to manage their project, okay? And provide a space for them as well to submit 
or to share the research plan. And as an instructor, we were to provide feedback to the research plan. Okay. So now step number six, learners implement the solutions. So provide a collaborative working space. And once again, in this kind of case, implementation may occur online or it may occur offline. Okay, so it depends on the subject matter. Okay. And learners evaluate their solutions. So provide an online space to test the solution with the targeted group. Okay, because this is about solution to the targeted group. So there is a need for us to provide that online space as well. And the next step, step number eight, learners present their solutions. So provide a space for the learners to present their challenge, their implementation, their evaluation results. And finally, provide a space for reflections yeah, to, uh, to avoid this uh, last step of challenge-based learning. Okay, the mapping with the online evidences. Same thing, explain the expectation. You can actually use learning resources, creation tools. And to allow some kind of interaction for clarification, you can use another category of tools known as the chat tools, or you can use discussion tools for that particular purpose. All right, providing guiding resources. These are the affordances that you can actually use. Okay, provide a collaborative working space. Uh, you can actually use a collaborative online workspace uh, tools, yeah, the one that uh, 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 Kimon has presented. Provide a space for learners to present their big ideas and the challenge. All right, uh, presentation visual tools, screen recording, and these are the example of the tools that the learners can use to present, right? And provide a space for each group to discuss and brainstorm. So you can use these tools, right? And provide a space to prepare, to plan their project, to manage the project. Use project management tools for that, okay? Space to submit. So use database tools, assignment sub submission tools. Okay, providing feedback. So these are examples of tools that you can use to provide feedback. Okay, so I have explained that earlier on, so I will go quick. So as for step number six, uh, do provide a collaborative workspace uh, uh, by using some collaborative workspace tools, yeah, uh, to allow the learners to implement their solutions collaboratively, all right? and uh, provide a space to test the solution with the targeted group yeah? because that solution need to be brought to the targeted group. So maybe some social networking tools can be utilized or maybe some group messaging tools can be used yeah? so that the students can actually uh, show their solutions to the targeted groups yeah? or maybe using some asynchronous communication tools like email and, and so on and so forth. So example of group messaging tools would be using WhatsApp, using Telegram, yeah? allowing the students to actually uh, show the solutions to the targeted uh, groups yeah? or targeted communities. Now, step number eight, to present it. So uh, you can actually ask the students to create a showcase e-portfolio by using the e-portfolio tools, create video by using video editing tools, as well as uh, create, uh, uh, sharing it with the public by using some social networking tools yeah, that I've mentioned uh, in the previous strategy, okay? And of course, the last part is to provide the reflection yeah, by providing, by using some kind of a reflection tools, yeah? So here I'm summarizing the nine steps of challenge-based uh, learning. It's mapping to the online learning design as well as the online affordances yeah, to support the online learning design, okay? And reaching the final strategy, which is team-based learning. So by just reading the, uh, the phrase itself, we know that team is the keyword, right? So we're talking about a flip approach here in team-based where um, students actually create their knowledge through uh, individual and group testing, as well as group collaboration. And basically, students will be given some materials yeah, before the actual session. And they are asked to actually work on the material, study the material. And when the actual, actual session begins, students will be tested, okay, will be tested. And the marks for an individual students in that team will actually, uh, uh, no, sorry, the marks of a uh, the team yeah, can actually affect the marks of the individual in that team. So that is how the flip approach is being implemented to ensure that materials that are given are actually read or studied by the teams of students. Yeah? The lecturers or the instructor that will pose relevant problems that reveal students' misconceptions, 
trigger interaction and debate among learners. See, learning a lot uh, occurs you know, through interaction as well as debating. Okay? And teams of learners work toward the solution to the problem, share their solutions, and debate on their choices of solutions. So that is uh, how TBL works. Yeah? So it's very learner-centered, follow the social constructivist paradigm, and the tasks are derived from the knowledge domain. Okay? So how many steps are there in TBL? There are six steps. Yeah? So first step, the instructor provides learning materials, yeah, as I mentioned. A very flipped learning kind of approach. Yeah? So learners complete the preparatory materials within a given time frame. So they need to learn it, they need to study it. Then second step, learners will have to do a test. Okay? Learner completes the readiness assurance testing. Usually it's in the form of an MCQ. And in that particular process, what is interesting is learners can actually appeal for unsatisfactory questions or even unsatisfactory answers. They actually can appeal. So the instructor will provide guidance during this process. Yeah? So in step number three, the instructor provides relevant problems that reveal students' misconceptions, trigger interaction, and debate among the learners. Yeah? And uh, step number four, learners will present their best solutions. Yeah? So the team will present their best solutions. Then the learners start to debate you know, with each other, yeah? they debate on other team solutions. So the role of the instructor in this process is basically to facilitate the discussion, to facilitate the debate yeah, between the teams yeah? uh, so that uh, they can actually get the answers to the problem. Yeah? So, and finally, learners need to assess their peers in their own team. Okay? So there are six steps all together in TBL. Okay? So the mapping, okay? first step, provide learning materials. In our online learning environment, we need to provide the learning materials, right? So second step is learners will complete the test. So in our online space, we need to provide a test as well, okay? But this test should be with immediate feedback and recorded scores yeah, to both individual and team, yeah? because as I mentioned just now, the score is actually important yeah? and it's being recorded. And provide a space for discussion because learners can appeal for unsatisfactory questions or answers. And uh, during this process, the instructor can actually provide guidance by providing uh, even some mini teaching yeah, if it's uh, required. Okay. Now, step number three, the instructor will then provide some relevant problems yeah, to reveal the student's conception, trigger interaction and debate. So online space need to pause the problems, right? Uh, then learners need to present. So in our online space, we must provide a space for our groups of learners or the teams to present their respective uh, best solutions to the problem and let them uh, present. So we need to provide that space and learners debate on their team solutions. So we need to provide a discussion and a debating space yeah, with the instructors giving continuous feedback and guidance. Yeah? And step number six, which is the final step, we provide a space for the learner to assess their teammates yeah? because it's talking about team-based learning. So assessing the teammates is actually very important yeah, in this particular strategy. Yeah? So mapping it to the online affordances, providing learning materials, we can use learning resources creation tools. You all are very familiar with it by now. Second step, provide a task. Well, use graded quiz, okay? Provide graded quiz. Can use some of the gamification tools that uh, I have mentioned to you earlier on. Uh, provide a discussion space because they need to appeal if they are, and they are not satisfied. So provide some discussion tools. Use some discussion tools to, uh, to support this particular design, yeah? And if the lecturers or the instructor wants to give mini teaching, then the instructor can actually use some of the tools that are uh, uh, written here, okay? Now, the third step is pausing the problems. So can once again, using learner resources creation tools you know, for the instructor to pause the problem, okay? Learners present their best solutions. So you provide an online space for them to present. So once again, students can use this kind of tools for them to uh, create their presentation and provide a space, a discussion and debating space, yeah? So do we actually have debate tools? Do we actually have online debate tools? <laughs> yes, we do have, yeah? So we have uh, online uh, debate tools such as uh, 
Kialo, yeah, Kialo is a nice one. I think Kima is going to show you Kialo and Quora. Okay, so this is just an example of online debating tools that we actually can utilize. Yeah, and finally, in the last step of TBL, learners need to assess their peers, so we need to provide that space as well. So, what about the online affordances? Yeah, we actually have another category of tools called the peer assessment tools. Yeah, so if you're using Elite, you may want to consider the use of workshop, or you can use external tools such as peergrade.io, uh, Google Docs uh, Sheets with uh, add-ons, and TeamMax is also a very interesting uh, peer assessment uh, tool yeah, that you actually can explore, right? Uh, okay, so finally, this is the summary of uh, the steps in TBL, yeah? the six steps of TBL. It's mapping to the online learning design as well as the online evidences, yeah? So with that, I'll pass the session over to Kiman, yeah? Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone is still here. Uh, I see about 200 plus is still with us. Very, very good. Um, I'm going to wrap up with two last tools, uh, that, which has been mentioned by Prof Chen. Let me just... Uh, Challenge-based learning. Um, one of the one of the element in challenge-based learning is for students to curate materials or even to create uh, their own content. Okay, if you have no place to allow them to create the, this kind of documentation or e-portfolio, maybe you're so used to Padlet, you can use Padlet if you want to. But another uh, version that you can try or another app you can try is Wakelet, which is very popular now. Uh, it's like a one-page curation of a portfolio. So let's say learner created something, they can put it in, or they found something useful, they can also put it in, in relation to the topic that you have given them for the challenge-based activity, right? Or even assessment if you want to. Uh, one thing good about Wakelet is it's mobile-friendly. It doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, actually, uh, provided you don't include too many videos. But basically, if you put links or even uh, pictures, uh, tags, it will be OK as compared to uh, other portfolio methods like uh, using Google Sites or even other heavy, you know, bandwidth intensive apps, all right? So you can try a Wakelet. You can go to the link, it's the GD Wakelet guide. Quite a number of tutorial online as well. Uh, so for now, it's free, all right? I don't know how long, but I think it's, it's free for, for, for some time, all right? Okay. For team-based learning, uh, Prof Chen mentioned about the debating tool. This is a very nice one. In fact, a lot of people do not know this. It's called Kialo. Kialo is Esperanto for reasoning or reasons. So I think the name was chosen because Kialo empower, you know, uh, reasoning or reasons. So what happened? If you go to Kialo, you can create a topic or the discussion. It can be a single thesis, like pro and cons kind of thing, or it can be multiple theses, like a multiple angle. Um, for students to come in because you can add students into your Kialo or they can create their own Kialo um, and to do some debate. So you can, let's say, three students to go for pro, another three students go for con, and they start posting their, their arguments. For example, like this, uh, COVID-19 test should be given to all citizens. So they can come in and say, oh, okay, I, I agree, I disagree, and then they start posting. And you as a teacher, you can come in and start commenting and ask them to justify, provide links to uh, backup materials or justification to back up their point and, and so on. So it's very nice, very clean, no ads, and I think you should try it out. And um, if you're teaching language, you can use this for uh, brainstorming or debating topic or argumentative essays and all that. So it can, can be done. And because it's clean, not uh, you know overwhelmed with media, it's quite low bandwidth as well. It doesn't really consume a lot of bandwidth. So you can try it out, Kialo, okay? So that's the last two I'm going to cover. I know a lot of tools, a lot of strategies that you have listened for the past one and a half hour. Um, I hope you're okay, not saturated. There's so many tools out there. Um, but uh, before I pass it to Prof Chen, I just want to end with this. Um, I think every one of us should really do this. Enough of thinking about whether I should do this, whether I should not. Just do it first and let's see whether we can make the best of the situation so far. We know that we have, we have you know, no choice for now uh, to go online. Just figure out what we can do in order to help our learners because what matters is learning should happen regardless of MCO, COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it. But the pain to me is temporary, really, because 
um, if you just let it be and don't want to do anything about it, then it will be longer than it should. So just do something about this. If you know your students are having problem, let's say they're having low bandwidth problem, they cannot connect to you, try whatever mean you can first and let's work out uh, work this out together. Right. I think it's really crucial to try because I have heard a lot of things, but when I ask, have you tried this? No, have you tried it? No. Try first, all right? Try first and then let's see what we can do to overcome this. And as a bonus for loyal <laughs> listening to our session, I'm going to give you a bonus. You just go to, if you have not bookmarked this, just go to my chuakiman.com, this link, because I, I the link is quite long, so I just, just go to chuakiman.com and then click on the mega list of e-learning too. Just in case you think whatever we cover today is not enough, we have hundreds more tools that you can explore. I know you'll be telling me, okay, I don't have time to explore this. Never mind, just go through the list. If you see the top ones, those are the recommended ones, trial and tested. They are highly recommended. Try it first. If it doesn't work for you, let me know. We can work it out together. All right, I'm going to pass back to uh, Prof Chen now. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Kiman. Um, let me just share my screen again. So I really agree with what Kiman said. Yeah, the last bit. <laughs> uh, I would like to conclude yeah, by highlighting uh, four points here. So for me, I have explained the mapping of ed teaching strategies to their relevant online learning design. So generally, uh, the higher number of steps uh, involved in that particular strategies means the more complicated the online design will be. Yeah? So that is basically uh, the general rule. And second point that I would like to highlight is in this section, you actually been introduced to uh, slightly more than 20 categories of tools, um, mostly uh, listed here. So indeed, yeah, as mentioned by Kiman just now, there are hundreds and even thousands of online tools yeah, that online educators can explore. Yeah? So many of these tools uh, have functions and features that can actually replicate the processes that we adopt in our face-to-face -face sessions and even beyond the face-to-face -face possibilities. Yeah? So I would like to conclude that online teaching and learning can be very interesting and very exciting yeah? if it is carefully designed. Okay? And third point, so far I've been making assumptions that our learners have good connectivity, right? Uh, at least 3G and above. So if we have uh, learners with minimal connectivity, uh, is our presented content still relevant? Uh, I would say the mapping of the different uh, teaching strategies yeah, with the uh, online learning design is still applicable, yeah? but the online affordances, the tools, will need rethinking yeah? as the uh, only limited number of tools can be utilized in such uh, situations. Yeah? So uh, you could see that, uh, sorry, uh, let's get back. Yeah? Online educators will need to creatively yeah, tweak the functions that are available in these limited types of tools to afford the online learning design. Yeah? I wouldn't say that all online design can be supported yeah, with this uh, minimal number of tools and functions, but I'm confident that some basic design can still be supported. Yeah? And my final word to everyone, <laughs> a proper online learning design is actually essential yeah, to create meaningful and engaging learning experience for our learners. So why not give it a try, yeah? Right, with this, uh, I end my talk and thanks so much for listening. And I would like to pass back the session to Kiman, yeah? Kiman, please. All right, thank you, Prof Chen, for sharing. We have a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Some, has been, uh, some have been answered, but I would like to pick on maybe two for Prof to uh, answer. Some critical one, the, the technical explanation, like uh, what is the definition of that, we will answer and then send it through email to all of you so that everyone has a copy. Uh, let me go through a bit. Okay, from uh, Associate Professor Dr. Pua. Traditional face-to-face -face classroom teaching hour is 42 for a three credit course. Any suggestion on the ideal teaching hour live when the course is conducted online? I think the question here is more or less like, um, should we make it like if it's uh, 42 face-to-face, -face, then we should also do 42 live. Uh, your take, Prof Chen, maybe. Okay, uh, this is a very interesting question. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, for Unimas uh, lecturers at this moment, you are already thinking of uh, how you actually convert your uh, teaching to online. So a lot of the 
lecturers think that uh, if I have one hour lecture, then if I have one hour live lecture, that would be the simplest thing to do, right? So, well, this is a possible solution, but it may also cause other problems. Huh? First of all, before you actually can do that, you have to ensure that all your students have good connectivity because you talk about live classes, right? That's one thing. And secondly, imagine you have a three hours class for a straight three hours class and you actually give live classes for three hours. Uh, what would be the complication? Yeah? Uh, students may complain later on that uh, you are using up all their mobile data. <laughs> Could be one of the things. So my suggestion is that uh, I wouldn't say that it's not okay to do that, but I think that what you are doing now is just doing direct teaching. So I have introduced you so many teaching strategies. So maybe, or I think you should, <laughs> most lecturers should reconsider, you just don't do direct teaching, right? You should actually complement it with other design as well, okay? Other activities and other teaching strategies as well so that the learning can be more meaningful and more engaging. So don't just limit yourself to direct teaching, right? So I, I think that's a little bit of comment from me. Yeah, back to you, Kiman. Okay, there are a few questions about the tool just now. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Most tools are, are not really free, but I think uh, we try to make use of the free ones. Like for example, Flip Grid used to be $44 per month until Microsoft acquired it. And Bill Gates says, no, we're going to make it for free. So Flip Grid is now totally free for everyone, for educators and students. So perhaps we need to have more people or more organizations like this who can actually support the usage of all these tools, like uh, Google for Google Classroom, for example, making it free for so many people to use, right? It's not easy to have the kind of investment to, to support. If you're talking about tools like Kialo, which is a very small company, they still need our money to kind of support. I think if you think it's worth it, why why don't you go ahead and purchase it? For example, Loom and Zoom and all this. If you think it's useful for you, just maybe invest a little bit on that. Um, another question from Melissa. Melissa asks, how do we select a suitable approach for students? Do we consider the subject matter that is being taught or on the majority of the student learning style? You get that, Prof Chen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think both are important. Uh, subject matters important. Students' learning styles are also important. But I believe subject matter uh, should be given the priority because we know best on how the students can learn best. You know, uh, using our uh, approaches. Um, but uh, having to said that, uh, talking about students' learning style, if we go online, yeah, in fact, we can actually cater more learning styles yeah, uh, compared to just face-to-face. -face, yeah. I see that uh, Kimon is actually noting. Maybe you want to add a little bit on that? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, I agree with Prochen on that because all this while we are talking about education should not be one size uh, fits all, right? But when we do face-to-face -face teaching, we didn't realize that we are actually doing one size fits all. You know, we talk in front, we give the same material and all that. But the moment we move online, actually, we start thinking, you know, what happened to those B40 without internet? What happened to all this group without, you know, psychomotor? How, how do I teach psychomotor? You start to think of different uh, styles or different types of learners. I think it makes it open up uh, in terms of diversity of learners when it comes online. When it's face-to-face, -face, we tend to ignore all this. Nobody question what you did in a face-to-face -face, uh, setting when you are just delivering your lecture, right? Nobody question your one-size-fits-all approach. But now everyone is talking about um, nobody can uh, can do online and all that, but it's the other way around. I think I, I do agree with Prochen when it comes to that. You want to add on Prochen, or I can move to the next question? Yeah, I think when you go online, actually you have a lot of uh, possibilities, and you see materials also presented in different format. You see, as you know, that learning styles we talk about students learning uh, best to different formats, right? So by using online, you actually can allow that to happen. Yeah? So really, I think online is actually sometimes. And a lot of time, it can be better. It can be more exciting than face-to-face, -face, but it has to be carefully designed, right? I have a few questions, actually are quite similar. Maybe I can just sum up as one first, then the rest that we will answer one by one. Um, is the um, the issue of psychomotor and practical skills, all this lab, you know, how do we do it online? Are we supposed to compensate it with online activities or are we just supposed to ignore them for a while and then do it when we are ready to do it uh, face to face what's your take Prof. Jen? 
I think I have said myself just now. Yeah, remember I have a number of steps. I said that implementation can be done online or offline. Okay, so um, basically, uh, I wouldn't say that everything can be done online. Okay, there are things that require some physical spaces, physical objects. That's uh, you just cannot do it online. Yeah? So. Uh, I really cannot say that everything can be done online in that sense. Yeah, so uh, we leave it to the subject matter to decide on what is the best way to do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but for example, suddenly if you ask me because I have a lot of questions like, how do you teach football online? I say, yeah, you can play FIFA twenty and see whether you learn from footballing skills there. Um, there, there are things that we cannot do online unless, of course. You you change the focus a bit instead of the skills. You instead of teaching psychomotor, maybe more on the cognitive part or maybe on the affective part and all that. So a, a bit of fine tuning. But we do hope that this situation will not uh, go on and on, and we can go back to face to face uh, uh, teaching and learning soon, right? Uh, yeah. Another question from Dr. Wong about all this issue about majority of the students having no access to devices and also uh, internet. Uh, is there a way or advice for best uh, online teaching to to substitute face to face teaching? I think. How do we reach out to the group of students who have no internet at home or no devices? Some some are, we we do know that students are uh, using laptops or even uh, computers in 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 the library and in the computer lab, right? So how do we help them? Hmm. I guess uh, this kind of uh, assistance, yeah will be the university level kind of position, right? So uh, there are plans, for instance, uh, at the university level to allow the students to actually go to the nearby institutions uh, to get the access. So like, for instance, uh, if they are in uh, somewhere in Simulanjo, in Johor, for instance, if they are they're living near to UTM, for instance, they actually can go to UTM to get the access. Yeah? So same like, you know, those, uh, UTM students in Unimas, for instance, they're actually allowed to go to Unimas to get the access, yeah? But uh, anyway, uh, I cannot say much about this because all this uh, uh, decision is not finalized yet. And there are a lot of consideration in the current situation. You know, looking at the fluidity of the situation, we just cannot make any final decision at this stage. Yeah? But we do realize that we do have students with uh, very bad connectivity. The worst thing is you do not have internet connection. Okay, So how to go about that? You can't proceed with that internet connection. Uh, well, you just cannot go online, okay? Unless you really go for the very traditional way of doing things, you know, posting uh, materials for them. Uh, and then, uh, well, that's really requires a lot of thinking, okay? Uh, so I am not so ready to talk about it, okay? Uh, because you don't have internet connection, so you don't talk about online. You've got to think of other mode, okay? So if you've got computer, you don't have internet connection, I may still send you some uh, soft copy, in, uh, save it in a pen drive, for instance, I can still pause it to you, you still can retrieve in your computer. But if you're telling me that you don't have a computer, that's mean, <laughs> okay, I get back to you, Kiman, to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's quite, quite hard. I would agree it's quite hard. But I, um, there, there, there has been a lot of... Um, there have been a lot of discussion about this and some propose the conventional way like mailing the things to the students and all that. But I think if we can move the student back home now... Yeah, that will settle everything. Yeah, that yeah. will settle everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why don't we also move them in June or July later? Move them um, somewhere where internet is okay. I mean, if uh, the, we are allowed to do yeah, so. Yeah, the, right? the decision is from the government, right? From the Majlis yeah, Kaslam. Yeah, but we can't, we can't say... Yeah, we can't really say anything, anything, you know, until there are some decisions from the a higher level so we understand your concern we are also very concerned and we are trying to make the right decisions yeah based on the decision from the uh, upper level right there are a lot of discussion about how to a lot of question about how to how to reach out to all this low connectivity one to be honest i've been testing a lot of uh, apps and all that what i found out is the chat app by whatsapp and telegram are quite useful for low bandwidth usage and um, you can explore those uh, mm. you know method I know it's a bit um, uncomfortable to share your phone number to your students and all that. Maybe you can get a different SIM card or whatever. But I, uh, for for low bandwidth usage, some students are able to actually 
at least type something in WhatsApp using at least a 2G or even sometimes GPRS, it can be sent. Just that it's very minimal space if you want to reach out. But again, if you're talking about asking them to do videos, to do long or lengthy report, then it's not that feasible. But for now, I think we just have to pray hard that this is not going to go on and on. We can still try to reach out to them and help them whenever we can. But for, for those that has uh, internet and all that, you try to reach out to them first, I think. At, well, at the same time, tell the uh, tell those without connectivity or low connectivity to, to do something else first, maybe. All right? Or even they can mail in work if they want to. Right? I just sent out an instruction to my student. If you can't do it online, you can just write it on a piece of paper or type it out. If you have printed, if you don't, just write it out and send it to my house for now, right? if you need some uh, guidance or help. But um, a lot of questions about screencasting, whether you need a uh, camera or not. Screencasting, do not need a camera. Even if we don't have a camera, you can still screencast because it's built in in all operating system where it can capture, OK? Uh, let me see if, if not, I think we are quite OK now. I think the rest um, we can answer it uh, yeah, I think, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have under, oh yeah, uh, Madam no, A mentioned about underprivileged students who may need personal guidance. I think this one requires requires a different touch, I think, not just as uh, our, as a teacher or educator or lecturer, we need to reach out to them for other factors as well. They may have problem with uh, language barrier or other, other issues. I think that one, I do agree. It's not just about online or not online. Some families are not even conducive to do anything, right? They have a very mm -hmm. small room. You know, I have students who stay three siblings in one room you know they can't even do things together a lot of issues but i think we pray hard that this will not go on forever uh i'm gonna try to end this session now because it's almost four and you need to start cooking <laughs> for those who are uh, going to break your fast the rest of the questions we will compile it and answer it and then email to everyone who has participated today Thank you so much uh, on behalf of CAM for your participation today. We are overwhelmed by your active participation in terms of the question asked, in terms of your chat, even, you know, the number of, we, we were overwhelmed really. Uh, having more than uh, 250 participants at one time is really, really intriguing for us. Uh, yeah, Project, any last so word from you? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for participating and staying until the very end. <laughs> and uh, really, uh, Deep from my heart, thank you so much once again for the support and hope we can all do well in our online teaching, right? Okay, see you in other events. <laughs> all right, okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hope to see thank all of you, you again in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.